the beginning uh, as I will be spoke, or maybe I will close it. Tak, 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 tak. Wtedy Państwo nie oceniają. Uh, esteemed jury, dear participants, listeners, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of Student Scientific Association of the Medical University of Silesia, it is my greatest pleasure to welcome you on the psychiatry and sex health session during the 69th edition of the SIMC International Medical Congress of Silesia 2023. My name is Martina Gelbas, I will be your host. Michael is my co-host, so in case of any problems, we are here for solving them and for a great performance of the session. I would, like, I would like to welcome our uh, jury, Professor uh, Krzysztof Krysta. Uh, Dr. Magdalena Piekza. Dr. Katarzyna Zbrosna. Uh, MD Joanna Smolarczyk. Oraz MD Patryk Rodek. I'm sorry. Okay, I would like to um, remind you the rules of the session. The order, the order of the presentation is the same as the abstract book. Uh, so I hope that all of you are aware where are you in the in the in the session. The maximal time for presentation is seven minutes and three minutes for the discussion. And this is my strong reminder. I will be measuring the time. So in case you overstep your time in both the presentation and the discussion, I will give you a sign or you will hear sound of the timer. And in case you have exceeded the time, please move straight to the conclusion. Um, okay. As we are not in a strictly English spoken session, participants can present in Polish and can present in English. For English speaking, I will be ad adding additional points. Also, if the presentation is carried on in English, the discussion must be carried in English as well. Uh, in case of Polish, it can be done in Polish. Okay, uh, I'm checking if I'm not skipping anything from the from the rules. Um, dear jury, please kind please assess points for scientific value, way of presenting, discussion, and own contribution between one to five points for each uh, of the of the fields. I will be adding points for English and for overstepping time, and I will be uh, handling the overstepping time counts. Okay, uh, as we are not using tablets, after the session ends, please uh, give the assessment cards back to me or to um, Michał, who is my coordinator. And for that, uh, we don't have members of jury online as far as I'm concerned, so we don't have to deal with sending back email um, assessment cards. So with that said, do any of you have any questions whether um, concerning the the session performance? Yes. Okay. If not, please welcome the first first uh, presenter, uh, Zuzanna Mielczarek. Uh, with the paper titled An Analysis of Polish Psychiatrist Consultations of Display Dis Displaced People from Ukraine. I'm so sorry for my language today. <laughs> the stage is yours. Please stand in a way that you can be visible. By us. Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Zuzanna Mielkarek, and it's my pleasure to start today's session and to present the results of our research uh, concerning an analysis of Polish psychiatric consultation of displaced people from Ukraine. Um, maybe try using this one first. I will find the pointer, but. Yes, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry, this was my malfunction. Uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has led to one of the largest crisis, refugee crisis in our recent history. 
and many of internally displaced uh, Ukrainians and refugees uh, will need care for PTSD, anxiety, and depression. And uh, in addition to housing and financial support, uh, we should support their mental well-being. Can you hear me? 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 Uh, the situation is so complicated that the previous mental disorders overlap uh, new ones caused by uh, outbreak of war, uh, acculturation stress, and isolation stress of relocation. And we must remember that the complicated situation, political situation in Ukraine is not only matter uh, the one uh, last year. Uh, it's also a great challenge for Polish psychiatrists uh, who have to face language barrier, uh, cultural different differences, and um, uh, um, and so due to the large scale of problem and um, and the importance of the topic nowadays, we decided to take a closer look on various aspects of these consultations. And uh, so we tried to analyze the psychiatric consultations of displaced people from Ukraine. Uh, we conduct an anonymous survey among polar psychiatrists uh, regarding consultation with the patients from Ukraine. And our questionnaire consists of questions about the doctor's attitude to consultations, as well as the profile of doctors and patients. And the data collected from the service were analyzed using descriptive statistics and compared with relevant literature. So going to results, uh, we asked 42 psychiatrists uh, who participated in National Psychiatric Congress they are equal men and women, mainly between age from 30 to 40 years old. And um, most of them, 62%, were specialists in psychiatry, and the rest of respondents were residence doctors. And uh, for the place of work, over 50% of them um, reported mental health clinics and also uh, private practices. Uh, what's the most important? 81% of ASK doctors met patients from Ukraine in their daily practice after Russian invasion. But as we can see uh, in the graph, uh, doctors uh, admit this patient not on large scale. And in 85% of them, uh, they see their patients in public health facilities and only in 50% uh, in private practices. Um, for understandable reasons, uh, the vast majority of patients were women, uh, mainly in age for 25 to 40 years old. Uh, as you can see, uh, the most commonly reported symptoms were anxiety, as in 62% of patients, uh, depressed mood in 50% of patients, restlessness and sleeping problem in about 30% uh, of patients. And the Ukrainian patients uh, were most often diagnosed with mood disorders, 60% uh, of patients, and neurotic and stress-related and somatoform disorders, 53% uh, of patients. Uh, the 65% of psychiatrists uh, reported uh, that uh, in their opinion, uh, the war uh, had an even worsening of symptoms that, uh, that um, were present before the war. And um, only in, in 23% uh, had, inf had impact on onset of new symptoms. And the symptoms that were exacerbated by the war were anx anxiety, restlessness, and depressed, the depressed mood. And uh, very similar were symptoms that uh, appears new in connection with war. And uh, here was also sleeping problems. Language barrier, however, turned out to be uh, a big problem. Uh, because uh, about 50% about, uh, of doctors reported that they tried to communicate with their patients in Polish and uh, it affected the, uh, the quality of consultations and uh, difficulties in communications uh, led to problem like, uh, problems with diagnosis or the implementation of treatment and, and with communicating instructions to patients. <clears throat> and the last questions. <laughs> It worked? Okay. Uh, the last question we asked was about pharmacotherapy, and in nearly 80% of situations, uh, it was necessary to change pharmacotherapy uh, due to uh, such problems like drugs were not available in Poland or the patient's conditions required a change in treatment. And also, we try to compare our data with those uh, in scientific articles, and we find an Italian study. Uh, which showed that uh, which was conducted um, between people uh, who uh, who were in places of temporary stay uh, in Przemysl and in Lviv, and it reported high or very high levels of anxiety, depression, anger, and sleep disturbances. And uh, it was related with the duration of their trip and the numbers of day uh, they spent at this center. And another article indicated the uh, need to spread awareness about uh, mental disorders uh, among. Uh, 
refugees and how uh, psychiatrists can uh, provide them effective help. And we must be aware uh, that there are needed systematic solutions, such as greater uh, availability of uh, Ukrainian translate translators and also um, uh, psychotherapists who are qualified in dealing with war trauma. So to sum up, the most common symptoms reported by patients were anxiety and depressed mood. The most common diagnosed disorders were mood disorders and neurotic disorders. The war most often had effect on the worsening of symptoms already occurring before it. And we must be aware of how big challenges for polypsychiatrists and that we must uh, think about some systematic solutions. That's my references. That's all for me now. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I'm showing the Zoom. We should see the Zoom right now. Are we visible once again? Okay, so here is the time for the discussion. So, Istim um, Jiri, do you have any questions for our participants? Maybe um, Professor Krista? Um, maybe, uh, Just speak to the microphone. Uh, um, Let's stay here. I, I know this study very well because we did it together, but my question would be, did you have any personal experiences with meeting with um, uh, the refugees from Ukraine and to meet any of them? Did you know, talk to them? Did you have any experiences of your own? Um, I have an experience, but in the Italian hospital, because I was doing the Erasmus at the time when, when the war started. And uh, in Italian hospital, there was not so many uh, refugees from, from Ukraine. And uh, I met some of this and they took me as a translator for them as because I'm Polish and they're Ukrainian, so I talked to them. And uh, I, I've seen this, uh, the signs of anxiety, of depressed moods, and it was it was significant. In Ferrara. Okay. Any more questions about um, our participants' distribution? Okay. So maybe uh, I'll ask the question. Uh, can you tell us about your own? input into the into the research into the presentation uh, so we made questionnaire by ourselves and uh, we later we um, were <coughs> working on uh, we tried to we tried to find the essence of uh, of this issue and to present it in a simple way okay that's great if there are no more questions for the presentation, I would like to thank you. Thank you for the presentation. That was the first presentation. You can go to the, to the audience right now. Thank you very much. Now we are moving on to the second presentation. Hope it is visible. Oh my, this will be like this. Is the second presentation visible? Okay, so once again, I will try to show it. This should be, is it visible right now? Okay, so please welcome Michal Vadon the author of the paper entitled The Presence of the Depression Symptoms with Patients Suffering from uh, ABD as a Result from Chronic Inflammation. Ladies, gentlemen, all gathered here. Uh, my name is Michal Wadling and it's a pleasure to me to present my study, The Clinical Symptoms of Depression with Patients Suffering from IBD as a Result of Chronic Inflammation. To begin with, why did I take this topic up? Nowadays, it's really important to treat patients holistic. Some processes in our organism impact on our mental health and vice versa. 
Moreover, the chronic inflammation is a common link of these two diseases, inflammatory bowel diseases and depression. It is commonly accepted that the IBD are associated with the chronic inflammation uh, and genetic predisposition. And after the environmental factors, it comes to the disorders of immune system. The leukocytosis growth of white blood cells and synthesis of cytokines are observed during the depression. The role of interferon gamma is to produce some interleukins, such as interleukin first, six TNF alpha. These interleukins play a key role in activation and migration of white blood cells. The role of IL6 is to stimulate hepatocytes to produce C-reactive protein. Um, as we can see, some interleukins, some proteins, and uh, white blood cells are the same uh, in the inflammatory bowel diseases and depression. The aim of the study was to show the correlation between the clinical symptoms of depression with patients suffering from IBD and the uh, chronic inflammation as a result of the common pathogenesis of these two diseases. 50 adult patients took part in the study. The study took place on the Department of Gastroenterology and Hepatology of UCK in Katowice. Um, during this uh, study, I used the Bex depression inventory. The result of more than 11 points means uh, the clinical symptoms of depression. Uh, I also used some inflammatory factors such as CRP uh, concentration in serum and white blood cells level in complete blood count. I measured the inflammation, which means the inflammatory factors above the norms. And now we are going to the two most important parts, so results. 22 patients who had no inflammation also received 11 and less points in Beck's depression inventory. 11 patients who had an inflammation received more than 11 points. 12 patients who had inflammation received less than 11 points. However, only four patients who had Mm, no inflammation received more than 11 points. In the groups of patients who had no inflammation, the results was between two and nine points, what means no clinical symptoms of depression. In the group of patients who had mm, the uh, chronic inflammation, 50% of patients uh, received between four and 22 points in Beck's depression inventory, what means the moderate depression. The statistical analyze showed that the correlation between clinical symptoms of depression and the chronic inflammation is statistically significant because the p-value was 0 0.004. Uh, I also presented this data for the groups of patients who are suffering from Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. As we can see, uh, nearly all patients who had no inflammation also received 11 and less points. Patients who had an inflammation received 11 more or less points. And the most important conclusions. There was shown uh, the correlation between the clinical symptoms of depression and the chronic inflammation with patients suffering from IBD. The inflammation might come to the symptoms of depression if patients are banned by the genetic predisposition when some environmental and psychological factors impact on them. The lack of inflammation might decide that the clinical symptoms of depression will not appear with the patient suffering from IBD. The inflammation is a significant link in the process of pathogenesis of depression next to the genetic predisposition, stressors, stressful, mm -hmm. uh, stressful childhood trauma, the disorders of neurotransmitter systems and disorders in the brain structures. 
In case of patients suffering from UC, the inflammation was the most important inflammatory factor than the patients suffering from Crohn's disease. Because of the common pathway of etiopathogenesis, we need to focus on the patients suffering from IBD, uh, on their uh, psychological and psychiatric diagnosis and take care of these patients. This study can be a point of assessment of other diseases which are associated with an inflammation and in the future um, can be a point of looking for some new therapies of depression which are associated with the limit of the peripheral chronic inflammation and the inflammation in central nervous system. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much for the presentation. The time was not exceeded. So, um, dear Julie, do you have any questions to the topic of inflammatory bowel disease correlation with depression? You have a microphone over there, please. Okay. Simple question. What, why did you choose uh, the back depression uh, inventory? What was the reason? Uh, first of all, I think that this is the inventory which some students can use. I can't use uh, more um, progressive scales, more progressive inventories, so I can use only the scale. Uh, and I think that this inventory described all of the symptoms, uh, such as emotional symptoms, the problems of motivation, of activity, physical activity, uh, which patients suffering from uh, depression can feel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, we can think about recommendations for the future for treatment of depression and other psychiatric disorders. Do you think that, uh, for example, anti-inflammatory anti medication can be useful in the treatment of mood disorders in the future? What's your opinion? Um, yes, uh, I uh, described it in my presentation because I think that it's a new progressive idea but um, I think that we can use in the future some bio biological treatment, which can focus on uh, our immune system and limit the some progress of inflammation, uh, such as uh, infliximab, adalimumab, or uh, new treatments, which will be focused on our biological treatment, um, not the medicines such as uh, paracetamol or ibuprofen. Okay, that was the time for the for the presentation, so not for the discussion. Uh, are there any more questions? Yes. Oh, so um, I'm so sorry, Michael. Could you pass the mic to the audience? Or thank you for the help. Okay, uh, maybe you said it. Uh, what was the way of collecting the data? Uh, were they outpatients? Mm -hmm. uh, the patients was of the Department of Gastroenterology and Hepatology, uh, so I needed to uh, go through the uh, long process of uh, documentaries <laughs> uh, and uh, tried to choose these patients. Um, and it was uh, really difficult because on this department in the same time, I could find uh, only one, two, sometimes three patients. So I visited this department about 20 times, uh, but I think it was worth it for my uh, studies. Okay, so how long um, did it take? Uh, I uh, was doing my study from the December 2022 to the March 2023 uh, on the department, and then I made the analysis and write the article. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. If there are no more questions, thank you very much for thank your you. presentation, uh, for using excellent <laughs> English as a for my state. <laughs> Uh, okay, so with that being done, I would like to ask this third presentation. I'm sorry, I will have to go once again to upload it for our 
Okay. So please welcome uh, Jacob Bick, the presenter of a paper called Usage of um, Artificial Intelligence for Making Medical Diagnosis on the Basics of Epicrisis of Patients with Schizophrenia. Thank you. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, dear jury, uh, good morning. Uh, it's my great pleasure with my colleague uh, Agnieszka Goryczka to represent the Department of Psychiatry Internal Skigorya. And uh, today I'd like to speak to you about something with immense potential in revolutionizing healthcare, the artificial intelligence. Uh, our study focuses on usage of AI in, um, uh, in making the medical diagnosis based on the epicrisis of the patients. Okay, it happens. Sometimes it just blocks. So okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, nowadays we see uh, the uprising of the artificial intelligence. It took over the internet. Everyone are talking about it. And uh, many researchers, researchers and ordinary people are looking for some implementations of artificial intelligence in almost every field of our life. Uh, Medics, of course, uh, don't want to stay behind, and they also looking forward to apply the AI uh, in everyday use. Two main groups of uh, possible usage of AI are here in the bigger circles: is imaging analysis and clinical clinical decision support. But we can also see uh, another way to implement the AI in our work. For example by reduction of error in decision making and uh, in the therapy, <laughs> patient monitoring during the whole process of treatment, and future drug development. Uh, inspired by those researchers, uh, we wanted to, uh, to make our own study and uh, try to find out if the AI can be implemented to make a medical diagnosis and we used uh, the epicrisis as the base for the diagnosis. In our studies, we chose 50 patients, then acquired the epicrisis. Uh, then we anonymized them by uh, deleting the, uh, the sensitive data from them. Then using the AI, the DeepL, we made the translation from Polish to English, and then implemented uh, the uh, the epicrisis into the three chatbots, uh, Bing, ChatGPT, and GPT-4. And the question we asked the chatbots... I'm so sorry for what's happening. If this is happening, I'm trying to use this. Okay. okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, the question we asked was, what, what is the ICD-10 diagnosis for? And then we placed the epicrisis. And the war of the chatbots begin. Uh, Bing uh, showed a respectable 46% of the accuracy, but we have to remember that Bing is uh, mostly the uh, search engine, not the linguistic one like two others. So this result was the lowest one we get. And then moving into the newer generation of uh, AI, the link very advanced linguistic models made by uh, OpenAI, ChatGPT, which is the 3.5 version of, of the GPT, showed 72% of accuracy. And GPT-4, which is the newest iteration of the program, showed 80% of the accuracy, which is great, uh, great uh, outcome. That leads us to the conclusion that the study provides the evidence that artificial intelligence can be implemented uh, in, in medicine for making the diagnosis. Of course, there is still room for the improvement uh, because 80% of accuracy is still too low to uh, make the, uh, the precise diagnosis instead of the human diagnosis. So we have to remember that uh, AI can be used yeah. as a help but never uh, nowadays, uh, it shouldn't be led on their own, uh, but we can use it as a help in our decision-making process. Uh, 
We still need a bigger research with a bigger data, of course, and using not only the schizophrenia uh, as the as the base for the diagnosis to develop the AI in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to ask. Well, I have a question because there's some ethical issues because you said that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. The yes. uh, data were anonymized, but uh, I guess that you inserted uh, real actresses of real patients, yes? Yes. Yes. So uh, I'm not afraid that uh, even if you anonymize uh, personal data and if you still use the real actresses, uh, it may be a conflict with the protection of personal data. Uh, what's your opinion about it? Uh, the, an the anonymization was very precise, so we don't think there should be any conflict. We deleted all the uh, sensitive data, the anything that could lead uh, to the potential patient, to, to recognize the potential patient was deleted from the epic crisis. Also, you have to remember that uh, these chatbots, they can access anything on the internet. So they can also access, like for example, case studies from PubMed and so on. And there's always this issue with data protection. Um, I think like entire medicine is just, um, it, it's very important to, to protect this data. But at the same time, I think there's, uh, there's this like amount of uh, information that we simply have to um, fed into the chatbot in order to help develop new tools for for the future and yeah uh, my second question and uh, are you familiar with any uh, applications which are um, which takes advantage of this um, chat gpt um, um, ch 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 um, method which are uh, explicitly focused on the medical issues, on medical uh, data analysis. Are you aware of any application like this? Um, after my knowledge, I don't know about any specific applications. Uh, yeah, I, I think there are some applications which use also um, artificial intelligence and neuronal circuits. Uh, for example, there's this application which um, like you, a patient can make a photo of their um, um skin. like skin skin lesions and it can help to uh provide a like a pre-diagnosis if this can be something dangerous and if you should go see the doctor as soon as possible or if it's not not so dangerous so i know about this this uh, but it's of, not the uh, same engine like no it's not the same engine it's it is ai also it's neuronal circuits but it's not a uh, chat gpt yeah, it's just not yeah. a linguistic model yes okay Oh, yeah. we have quite a lot of questions. I have a question because uh, I was using the, uh, <laughs> I was using the chat GPT for the same things. I was just 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 giving them diagnosis and ask what is it, uh, for example, for my internal medicine studies, and and I was wondering because it sometimes gives very specific diagnosis when I and when I was. Um, it's, it was not so practical because the, the patient, for example, have just constipation and it, it, it gives me the answer that it's okay, it's cancer. Oh, it's it's an informatic disorder. So what do you think about the practice things of this, the more practical, because in the, the more simple answers of the diagnosis, not very specific. Yeah. Yes, I think we also we also asked like for a specific ICD-10 diagnosis. So we kind of wanted the uh, uh, GPT to tell us the specific one. Uh, but at the same time, I I see what you mean, and I think that this can that that's that's exactly why this can all, only be a help like a help uh, to us to consider like also what um, what kind of information it gave us but we can we cannot simply uh, just uh, use it as the only tool in the diagnostic process yeah okay, thank you. okay I'm sorry the time for the discussion for this work has ended I will be counting the time for us to leave the session on time <laughs> not stay here forever so thank you very much it's definitely was try the final one uh, and with that please let me ask the fourth presentation. I will share the screen right now.
change the title? Yes. yes. Uh, are we visible with the presentation? I will be always asking it for mm -hmm. the PDF space. Are we yes. Okay, thank you very much. So please welcome uh, Camila Meza with the paper entitled Analysis of Ego Resiliency and Its Relationship in a Group of Polish Men During the COVID-19 Pandemic. This the stage is yours. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Camila, and today on behalf of a research group from the Department of Psychiatry from Medical uh, Faculty of Sciences in Zabrze, uh, with pleasure I'm going to give a presentation on the topic Analysis of Ego Resiliency and its Relationships in a Group of Polish Men During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Okay, so let me start by saying a few words about my presentation plan. Firstly, I'm going to give a brief introduction, then I'll explain what the term ego resiliency actually means. Uh, later, I'll bring up the aim of our study. Next, in the materials and methods section, I'm going to give a comprehensive overview about how we conducted the study and what scales we used to make it the most accurate and reliable. Later, uh, I'll move on to the most important part of our study, which are the results. And in the end, I'll draw up conclusions. The societal response to the COVID-19 pandemic has become a subject of interest of numerous research groups. Uh, so as an effect, literature provides us with many information describing uh, particular groups feeling about the pandemic. Uh, for example, uh, older adults were more likely to feel lonely during the pandemic, children and adolescents were more likely to develop anxiety and depression, and females struggled with more anxiety and anger than men. Ego resiliency is a psychological concept that refers to individuals' ability to adapt to changing situations, cope with stress, and maintain a positive, uh, positive uh, sense of self in the face of adversity. It is a personality trait that is characterized by flexibility, emotional stability, uh, and the ability to respond to challenges with creativity and optimism. Research on ego resiliency shows that uh, individuals with higher levels of ego resiliency might be better equipped to deal with life's challenges and setbacks, while those with lower levels might be more vulnerable to stress and psychological distress. Uh, openness to experience and optimal regulation are the two components of ego resiliency. Openness to experience refers to a person's willingness to explore new ideas, try new things, and embrace new experiences. While optimal regulation, also known as emotion regulation, uh, refers to a person's ability to manage and regulate their emotions in a healthy and adaptive way. The goal of our study was to assess the impact of ego resiliency uh, on aggressive behavior, anxiety, and alcohol consumption in a group of Polish male participants. Our study was conducted entirely online. We uh, assessed the participants using an online survey. It was also divided into two phases. The first one took place between 24th April and uh, 8th May of 2020, and the second one took place between 5th February and 6th March of 2022. The first phase took place during the pandemic lockdown. Uh, it is important to notice that uh, two gro different groups of men took part in the two phases of our research. Uh, in the first phase, uh, 125 men aged between uh, 18 and uh, between 18 and 64 years old uh, took part, and 136 men aged between 18 and 68 years old took part in the second phase of our study. The aforementioned survey used cases such as the generalized anxiety uh, disorder seven, alcohol use, I think, uh, alcohol use disorder identification test, Pasperi aggression questionnaire, and ego resiliency scale. Uh, software that we used were uh, Statistica, and we analyzed the data with tests such as Shapiro Bilk test, World War II runs test, performance rank correlation, and re linear regressions. Uh, we also used Excel to present our results in tables, which I'm going to show next. So moving on to the most important part of our study, which are the results. Okay. 
So during the first phase, ego resiliency correlated positively with optimal regulation, openness to life experience, and verbal aggression, and it correlated negatively with hostility. During the second phase, ego resiliency also correlated negatively with anxiety, anger, and generalized aggression. During both phases of our study, optimal regulation correlated positively with openness to experience and verbal aggression, and it correlated negatively with anxiety, anger, hostility, and generalized aggression. During the first phase of our study, openness to life experience correlated negatively with hostility, but during the second phase, what we found particularly interesting, openness to life experience correlated positively with verbal aggression. According to the results of both phases of our study, optimal regulation affected anxiety negatively. Similar relationship was noticed while analyzing the impact of, regu uh, of optimal regulation on generalized aggression. Optimal regulation affects generalized aggression negatively during both phases of our study. The World Wolf Hobbits runs test showed uh, that for one of the variables, the P is lower than 0.05. Uh, we think that this could be a result of highly different epidemiological situation between the two study periods. So uh, let me sum up the whole presentation in the end. Fear and aggression are feelings that accompanied men during the whole pandemic. It was found that during pandemic, ego resiliency was an important factor modulating the aspects that we examine. According to our study, optimal regulation, which is a compound of ego resiliency, turned out to play the most important protective role against the fear and aggression. What's important to notice, the effect of optimal regulation was more significant during the second phase of our study. Thank you for your attention. Here's our bibliography, uh, and we'll be happy to answer any questions of yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Please, both of you stand so you are visible. Okay, the first question. I do have a question. Yes, I'm going to Yes. Okay. So uh, once more, thank you so much for your presentation. I do have a question. Uh, the online survey around uh, which platforms or social media were used to gather the data? Mm, well, uh, we used Google Forms to gather the data. Uh, our tutor um, shared the presentation, for example, on his Facebook profile, and people from all around the world generally could take part in this presentation. But it was, uh, it was uh, of course, conducted in Polish, so it was mostly a Polish uh, group of people. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Okay, so uh, once again, could you tell us about your own personal input into the research that you've conducted? Yes, of course. Um, we basically uh, jumped into a project, the project it, that was uh, already uh, begun, uh, as it was said, but by, by, by our tutor. Uh, however, um, we found it uh, particularly interesting to um, catch up with the situation when the pandemic uh, was, well, in the regression. So uh, we conducted the second phase of the study, uh, and then we analyzed the compiled uh, statistic data and, um, well, basically um, took out the results that, was, uh, that were uh, presented here right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, no more questions, I presume. So thank you very much once again for the presentation. And now we are carrying on with the whole presentation. No, that was it. No, the fifth. Yes, the fifth one. Thank you very much for having a hand on the situation in case I make any mistakes. Yes. So please welcome Karolina Kaminska, 
right? Karolina Kamilski. Karolina Kamilska. Yes. yes. With the paper entitled Symptoms of Bipolar Disorder Among Adolescents Residing, Residing at the Youth Educational Centers in Silesian Poland. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Karolina Kamińska, and it's a pleasure to show you the topic of our research, Symptoms of Bipolar Disorder Among Adolescents Residing at Youth Educational Centers in Silesia in Poland. Okay, let me start with the explanation. What are the youth educational centers? There are the centers for, for adolescents from 10 to 18 years old who are considered to be social maladapted. It means they, they commit act of hooliganism, they commit in, in trances, in fevers, or they abuse substance uh, that they are uh, uh, psychoactive. The main aim of this of these centers are to social adapt them to social norms through the process of resocialization. Okay, the current knowledge of the mental health problems of this youth is insufficient. We found only one uh, Polish article about it, but it was based only on questionnaire among heads of this institution, and it showed that in in 76% uh, of youth educational centers, there are depression symptoms. It might seem unusual for those who are considered to be hooligans. But it was just unipolar. What we wonder about, it's the, it's the uh, behavioral, behavioral disorders combined with affective uh, symptoms could be indicative of bipolar disorders among youths. And we found that aggression, impulsivity, and irritability are the main components of bipolar affective disorders among adolescents, which can lead, of course, to illegal situation. So therefore, the aim of our study was to measure the prevalence of mental disorders among inmates of youth educational centers with a main focus on bipolar disorder. We carry out our study in two youth educational centers in Poland, in Silesia, one for boys and one for girls. Uh, for girls. We used case sets uh, interview. It was, it was uh, conducted face-to-face -face orally, and one interview lasted about, on average, one hour. And uh, we mainly focused on mania, depression, ADHD, contact disorder, and substance abuse. And we also look at the retrospective documentation, and we did initial interview with them. Uh, we conducted this study on 80 participants, as 60% of them were boys. And we used statistic and experiment correlation to show the correlation between symptoms on KSAT's questionnaire. And the prevalence of mental disorder based on only on patient history in a psychiatric visit was only estimated on 10%. It might be small, but look at that. The prevalence of mental disorder based on our case set screening test on symptoms of this showed that it's, the amount is higher. So the depression was found in around 80, the, the symptoms of depression was found in around 80% of girls, 40% uh, of boys, and the, show, the symptoms of mania was shown in uh, around 40% of uh, girls and 30% of, of, uh, of girls. And the mania and depression positive simultaneously in 100% of boys. So that both mania and depression in girls was always correlated. And the main components of bipolar disorder uh, symptoms in, uh, in youths like irritability, impulsivity, expensive and self-interest was also very common in this, in this uh, people. And we did a spearman correlation, and it showed that aggression, like suicidal thoughts, was correlated more with depression and ADHD in mania, but mania was correlated with self-injuries. Also, the ADHD symptoms and the depression symptoms was very correlated, like we can see. But look at that irritability. It was, it was correlated both with mania, depression, and ADHD. So we can ask the question, is it the ADHD or mania? So in the research, uh, we can see that some diagnostic criteria of mania can, can be the ADHD symptoms. So the conclusion is that there is a problem with differentiation between mania, ADHD, and ADHD in youths. So our study suggests that uh, some of residents of youth educational centers can be suffer from undiagnosed bipolar disorder why it is important? It is important because 
it's not the place for for children like that. They didn't get the proper uh, pharmacotherapy, psychiatric consultation, and they are going to be worse and worse. So we emphasize the importance of initial psychiatric consultation of young people before they are placed in these centers, because in 83% of, of uh, youth educational centers, the access to psychiatric care is very difficult. So it's the problem. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm stopping the upload of the presentation right now. We are visible. Uh, who is joining us on stage? Uh, Isabella Rosu. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm giving you uh, the mic right now. And I see that we have the first question from Professor Krista. Yes. Uh, if you put your presentation, uh, was there any question about substance abuse? Because, uh, as far as my experience, uh, uh, substance abuse may also have impact on both uh, the symptoms of mania and ADHD in that age group. So that you take into consideration in your study. Yes, it's the it's a great question because in case that's a questionnaire, always we ask about if the symptoms is correlated with substance abuse, such narcotics or such alcohol. So we ask this and. It's, it was not enough time to show all the data we collected because it was it was it was so many because our average uh, every average uh, interview lasted like one hour sometimes we spent three hours with one person so so it was it was very the the data was very numerous so how long uh, how long does it take to collect the data? Uh, ten months. Ten months. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, each patient, you said uh, three hours. No, Sometimes. No. Sometimes. No. 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 Each. Uh, uh, it was uh, one by um, uh, which uh, which two, where we were we were talking three hours because um, we wanted to commit suicide and uh, because they had diagnosed a bipolar uh, bipolar disorder already. Um, I think that um, the shortest uh, interview uh, duration was a uh, half hour and this average time is one hour. Yes, it was very important for us to see this patient face to face because it's 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 different. And uh, what should be noted it that that we first we did a screening test with them, and then if some some someone have depressive symptoms, we ask this very specific with the specific questionnaire. Yes. So uh, when we uh, drove there, uh, we for example talk with uh, three persons a day, and uh, we. Um, we had to ask for many permissions because uh, the entry to this type of in institution uh, is very limited for outsiders. So I think that it was challenging, but it was worth it. And we are grateful for the experience. Yes, yes. it was a uh, great experience to talk with the patients. Yes, <laughs> so many. <laughs> So, and uh, so many uh, different persons, yes. so many problems, uh, histories. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we have one question from the researcher. <coughs> okay. You were telling that we have some problems with psychiatric care for children uh, in conclusions, and I would like to ask you, do you have maybe um, any ideas uh, how we can do that this psychiatric care for children will be more available? More money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, more, more money in the in the system. So I think that's the problem. And the, the centers of 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 uh, of uh, psychiatric care will be more indicative. I don't know the systems that the problems with this, but I think that's the problem. Yes, and I think that uh, there's a lack of uh, specialists uh, who would work with uh, adolescents with behavioral problems. I think that um, uh, we uh, diagnose autism nowadays, and uh, that's this uh, first uh, first uh, direction. Yeah. First there are not so many um, child psychiatrists in Poland. That's the problem. Yes, and yes. we need also a place to in work with. Uh, 
with aggressive, for example, adolescents. So in youth educational centers, they need to wait about about uh, one month for a visit. So it's it's hilarious yes. because they have many problems. And when, where should we uh, do it? Because in hospitals? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And we have filled the whole time for the discussion. So thank you once again for the thank you. Thank for you. the discussion. And we are moving on to the sixth presentation. Okay. Please welcome on stage uh, Adam Mazurski, right? Who will be presenting the uh, paper entitled Evaluating Factors Influencing the Differences in the Age of, uh, of Diagnosis of ASD in the Adolescents, Males and Females. Please stand in front of the camera and the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Mazurski and I have uh, uh, I have pleasure to present our study. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's not moving, try with this one. Okay. So, what is ASD? Autism spectrum disorders are among the most common developmental disorders in the whole world. It is estimated that 1% of uh, children worldwide will be diagnosed with ASD at some point of their life, which is very, very much. Although the symptoms of ASD begin to manifest Immediately after birth, they often remain undiagnosed until the environmental um, the environment exceeds the children's adaptive capacity, especially in fields of social interaction, social communications, and dealing with one's emotions. Uh, it often uh, starts when children hit puberty or begin their education. What's important, girls are generally diagnosed less frequently and later than boys. Uh, which was mm, proven in numerous studies. It's believed that uh, it's uh, because of their ability to learn more quickly from their environment, from their peers, uh, and to mask their problems. Uh, additionally, their symptom profile is often different from that presented by boys. The aim of our study was to compare the mean age of diagnosis in boys and girls attending the mental health clinic and psychiatric ward of the John Paul II Pediatric Center in Sosnovitz, and to assess if there are any differences, and if there are, what are the factors affecting them. We performed a retrospective analysis of data obtained from patients who either uh, were presenting to the mental health clinic in 2021 or were admitted to the psychiatric ward before 2022. Each patient attended uh, to free visits to a psychologist who, um, uh, who assessed uh, child social and developmental de develop, um, <laughs> child social and functional development, and uh, performed a number of diagnostic tests we will discuss later. As a result, we discovered that a total of 189 boys and 139 girls were diagnosed with ASD. As you can, uh, as you can see, the mean age of diagnosis in boys is, as expected, younger than in girls. Additionally, boys, more often than girls, presented symptoms from among so-called restrictive repetitive behaviors, such as motor stereotypes, compulsions, rituals, tics, and forcing a certain arrangement of objects around them. The difference uh, in frequency of these behaviors between both sexes is statistically significant, as we can see. And what's more, these behaviors uh, significantly lower the age of diagnosis in all children, but uh, this difference is not significant in girls, while it is significant in boys alone. As for comorbid mental disorders, we discovered that uh, children presenting uh, these disorders were statistically later diagnosed with ASD. And the difference is drastically more significant in girls alone, as we can see in the table. Uh, these results indicate that the late diagnosis of ASD may lead to development of more severe mental disorders, such as behavioral or affective disorders, and even schizophrenia. And uh, unfortunately, over 80% of girls 
and 70% of boys included in our study presented some kind of comorbid mental disorder. What's more, we found out that 43.2% of girls and 57.1% of boys demonstrated low fluctuation tolerance, which manifested in aggression in reaction to failure. The presence of this trait generally lowers the age of diagnosis in all children, but in girls alone, significantly more than in boys. And this indicates that aggression is generally more often perceived as normal in boys and doesn't cause them to be referred to a psychologist or a mental health clinic, as opposed to girls. Additionally, we found that 51.8% of girls and 43.4% of boys presented some anomalies in psychological diagnostic tests we mentioned before, uh, such as false beliefs of the second and third order, picture stories, explaining proverbs, understanding jokes, and metaphors. This difference is minor, but may indicate that uh, these tests are better suited to um, boys and males, generally. Uh, unexpectedly, stereotypical copies that are commonly associated with autism do not affect the age of diagnosis significantly. And uh, in the conversation, 44.7% of girls and 34.4% of boys had problems understanding metaphors. But children who didn't understand metaphors were not diagnosed later or earlier than those who did not have this problem, which indicates that this factor doesn't affect age um, of diagnosis in any way. So to conclude our presentation, we find out that as it was expected, girls are given a diagnosis of uh, ASD later than boys. Boys may be diagnosed earlier because they more, they more often um, present restricted repetitive behaviors and uh, increased aggression. Uh, what's very important, later diagnosis in girls result in more frequent development of comorbid mental disorders among them. And here we have the most important thing we, uh, we wanted to cover. Diagnosis of ASD in adolescent males and in, in adolescent females and requires a high level of caution. It's important to remember that they are often characterized with different um, symptom profiles than boys, and it's necessary, absolutely necessary, to raise awareness of these differences um, among psychiatrists and psychologists in order to diagnose girls and then women with ASD more quickly and more effectively and let them improve their quality of living. So, thank you very much. That's all from us. And if you have any questions, I will be more than ready to answer them. Thank you very much for the presentation. Are there any questions from the jury or from the audience member or for, from any other participants in line? Yes. Uh, it said that in girls, uh, they're diagnosed later and they have more comorbidities. Mm -hmm. So what, what, uh, what are the most common comorbidities come up with? Uh, well, actually, it is quite interesting because the um, in profile of comorbid mental disorders in girls is different than this of uh, boys. The uh, boys uh, most often presented affective disorders, and the girls, uh, um, the girls presented uh, such um, such disorders as schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorders, and depression. A uh, while. Uh, as we stated before, boys were more uh, likely to develop increased aggression and uh, like mania or this kind of disorders. Okay. Any more questions? If no, okay. please tell us maybe one more question. Please tell us about your own personal input into the work. Well, I can probably say that I performed all the statistics, all the statistical analysis in our study um, using the statistical software, as well as I prepared our presentation for you that you have just seen. So my input was quite significant. Um, yeah, and uh, I can say that it was a very good time working on it. Thank you very much you. for the presentation. You can uh, join us in the audience. And for the seventh presentation, we have an online participant, uh, Madara Krople. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your surname. Are you with us? Can you can you say? Can you show yourself? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can hear you, but we don't see you. Can you uh, show? The... Maybe I will try to have it like that, or like that. 
I, now I can see you, but the uh, okay. presentation is small. Oh, maybe like that. And maybe, like we can see you in this small spread. Is it all right for the jury members to have it like that? Okay, uh, the stage is yours. Please, you have seven minutes for the presentation. Uh, so, uh, good morning, everyone, uh, dear jury and uh, dear uh, participants. Uh, my name is uh, Madara Kraukle and I'm a medical student in uh, Riga Stradinc University in uh, Riga, uh, Latvia. Uh, today I will introduce you with my study, Psycho-Emotional State of Surgical Patients in the Post-Operative Period and Influencing Factors. My work's uh, tutor uh, was uh, Mara Kashe Sturmane. So a little bit about uh, the background. Uh, estimates of the prevalence of depression and anxiety following total hip uh, joint replacement vary. For example, in one study, 50% of total joint replacement patients had experienced clinically significant levels of depression symptoms two to four days after the surgery but only 5% remain so at discharge. But in another studies, uh, the rates of uh, cl clinically significant levels of anxiety also vary, for example, even from 8 to 85%. Ongoing symptoms of depression and anxiety uh, after this total joint replacement surgery may negatively impact patients' uh, recovery. For example, there are higher the uh, rates of post-surgical delirium, as well as 12-month um, mortality rates, as well as higher levels of uh, medication use. Uh, patients uh, experience poorer functional improvement and uh, require longer hospital admission. Uh, research objective uh, was uh, to find out the psycho-emotional state of the patients in this post-operative period and factors influencing it. Um, materials and methods, uh, 51 patient after first uh, time hip replacement surgery participated in this uh, quantitative cross-sectional study. Uh, this study was held in the Hospital of uh, Traumatology and Orthopedics in Riga, Latvia. Uh, that is the biggest uh, uh, hospital of traumatology and orthopedics in, uh, in uh, Latvia. And I used the hospital anxiety and depression scale and the researcher created survive uh, where uh, I when where I used uh, to evaluate patients uh, psycho emotional state and those uh, influencing factors. I, an I analyzed the data with the Pearson's G squared test, as well as uh, Fisher's exact test in SPSS uh, software uh, statistics program. So uh, here you can uh, see the results. Uh, the mean age of uh, participants was uh, 64 years. More than half, uh, 67, were women, but uh, th 33 were men. Um, more than a half, 61%, didn't have any signs of anxiety, but uh, 24 had mild signs of anxiety, but 50 50% had moderate severe anxiety. So, and if uh, we talk about the depression, uh, so 82% of all participants said uh, didn't have any signs of depression, 12 had light uh, signs of depression, but six had moderate severe signs of uh, depression. Also, I used the Pearson's uh, G-squared test and I figured out that the that there was no significant association uh, between gender and anxiety, as well as uh, Fisher's exact test showed that there was no significant association between gender and depression. Also, I uh, divided uh, patients into two groups. One group was uh, those who had uh, light pain or had no pain at all, 55%, and those who had mild or severe pain, 45%. And uh, there was no significant association between anxiety and these uh, two pain groups, as you can see, P 
and as well as uh, I didn't found any significant association between depression and these two pain groups. Uh, from those uh, questions that characterized anxiety, uh, most of the research participants uh, in, in varying in intensity feel stressed. You can see 85% of all the respondents. Uh, a sense of fear is 71%, but 69% um, uh, have anxious thoughts. And from those questions that uh, characterize depression, 77% uh, of the respondents mentioned that um, everything goes uh, slower in daily uh, activities for them. 59% uh, um, have a sudden panic attacks, at attacks but 49% uh, have this uh, restless feeling. So uh, to conclude, uh, study participants had different psychoemotional states. Approximately one third had various anxiety levels and one quarter had various levels of depression. And in my research, gender or pain significantly didn't affect a psycho-emotional state of the patients. So thank you for your attention and I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I will pass. No, we have the mic passed to the jury. So, are there any questions? I'm sorry, we will not be able to show you the jury members. They see you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I will ask the first question. Um, can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? My question. Can you hear the question of the jury? Uh, I can hear, but not really well. Hopefully, I will uh, understand. Is it better if we are speaking? Now it's better if I if I speak like this. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Maybe I will repeat the question. Okay. Yeah, that, mm -hmm. that would work. So I have two short questions. Uh, first, did the patients have any psychological support? Okay. And the second question is, uh, uh, do the patients? Uh, in somatic hospitals in Latvia have psychologists to support them in the, in the, during the disease. Okay, so the first question was about the psychological help for indi individual patients, right? And the second one was about the holistic uh, look at the hospitals in Latvia. Are there um, psychological supports for patients in hospitals in Latvia, right? Yes. Uh, so, um, to answer this question, unfortunately, uh, no. Uh, I have worked uh, before uh, as a physical uh, therapist in this uh, hospital. And as a physical therapist, I, I can see that after this uh, surgery, patients are uh, quite frustrated. They are depressed. They feel this anxiety. But unfortunately, in this hospital, even if it's bigger in Latvia, this kind of hospital, uh, people, uh, patients do not have any uh, psychological support. Of course, uh, after they get home, they can uh, do it, um, like uh, go to visit the psychologist or psychiatric. But in this period, uh, straight after the surgery, uh, unfortunately, uh, no, they do not have. Okay. Any more questions from the jury? Yes. Um, my question is, why did you uh, choose that sort of uh, patients, that uh, research topic, exactly this uh, orthopedic patients? Okay, so the question was, why did you choose this topic as your uh, paper topic, this exact um, group of patients? As I mentioned before, I worked with those kind of patients and I saw that there is the problem. So there is this... Um, uh, this area, what we could improve as a specialist, for example, to inform maybe patients more about what happens after the surgery to decrease the level of depression. Uh, for example, uh, uh, to uh, inform uh, them about uh, different kind uh, of uh, um, 
for example, things what they can do to help the, themselves to feel better. Uh, I choose th this uh, population uh, population be because I, I have a personal experience with those patients. That That's why. Okay, thank you very much. Can I have short questions? Very short. Maybe like three minutes have passed, but I would say that I am taking some of the time for translate or repeating the question. So is there anyone who does not agree for the last questions on this situation? Okay, so one short question. Okay, so my question is, were the patients with postoperative delirium excluded from the study group? Okay, I will try to repeat it. Are the patients with post... Uh, post-surgical or post-operative? Post-surgical or post-operative um, delirium. delirium excluded from the, from the research? Uh, yes, of course, uh, patients with delirium were excluded, as well as those uh, above 85 years were excluded, uh, because sometimes uh, there are uh, uh, difficulties for them to, uh, for example, to feel this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, hospital anxiety and depression scale. That's okay. why, yes, yes. Thank you very much for your presentation. No more questions. Thank you. Time for questions. So thank you very much. And we will be moving on to the eighth presentation. I'm uploading it right now. So the psychotherapy is also a woman uh, performed by Dzień dobry, nazywam się Betnia Fiska i pragnę Państwu przedstawić pracę pod tytułem Fizjoterapia też jest kobietą. Tytułem wstępu Fizjoterapia uroginekologiczna towarzyszy kobiecie przez całe życie. Obecnie jest sprężnie rozwijającą się dziedziną fizjoterapii, która stanowi ważny aspekt w powrocie kobiety po porodzie czy też ciąży. Odgrywa również kluczową rolę w procesie przygotowania kobiety do ciąży, likwidacji objawów wynikających z bolesnych miesiączek czy też poprawy, przyczynia się do poprawy satysfakcji seksualnej. Okay. Znaczenie fizjoterapii w, podczas ciąży oraz połogu. Połogiem nazywamy okres po ciąży i porodzie, w którym dochodzi do powrotu ustroju do stanu sprzed ciąży, jak również do wycofania się zmian ciążowych wynik na tle anatomicznym, morfologicznym czy też czynnościowym. Zaliczamy do nich między innymi regenerację ran pooperacyjnych, rozpoczęcie procesu laktacji czy też karmienia piersią, jak również zmniejszenie rozmiarów macicy. W tym procesie należy uwzględnić również szereg zmian na tle hormonalnym i psychologicznym, dlatego zarówno w okresie ciąży, jak i połogu bardzo ważna jest rola całego zespołu interdyscyplinarnego, którego skład wchodzą między innymi lekarz, fizjoterapeuta, położna, doradca laktacyjny czy też psycholog. Dzięki integracji całego tego zespołu interdyscyplinarnego możliwe staje się sprawniejszy powrót kobiety do stanu sprzed ciąży, zaliczając to powrót do aktywności seksualnej czy też odzyskanie dawnej sylwetki. Celem naszej pracy była analiza poziomu wiedzy i opinii studentek kierunków medycznych na temat zastosowania fizjoterapii uroginekologicznej w okresie okołoporodowym. W badaniu brały udział 103 studentki będące studentkami uczelni medycznych w całej Polsce i badania, w badaniu użyto autorskich kwestionariusz ankiety, który rozprowadzono drogą internetową w okresie od 1 lutego do 17 lutego 2023 roku. W badaniu użyto również metody sondażu diagnostycznego. 
Podział respondentek ze względu na wiek. Występowało znaczne zróżnicowanie ze względu na wiek, ponieważ w badaniu wzięło udział kobiety od 18 do 45 roku życia. Procentowy podział respondentek ze względu na kierunek studiów. Jak możemy zaobserwować, w badaniu wzięły udział studentki niemal wszystkich kierunków medycznych w całej Polsce, z czego największy odsetek stanowiły studentki kierunku fizjoterapia. Niemal 90% respondentek twierdzi, że spotkało się już wcześniej z pojęciem terapii mięśni dna miednicy, co stanowi przeważającą większość. Największa grupa ankietowanych uważa, że raczej nie występują przeciwwskazania do fizjoterapii uroginekologicznej w ciąży, jednak bardzo podobny procent, prawie 30%, twierdzi, że nie posiada wiedzy na ten temat. Z badań wynika, iż zdaniem respondentek do głównych niemiedliwości występujących u kobiet w ciąży zaliczamy obrzęk i ból stóp, bóle stawów krzyżowo-biodrowych e, oraz e, rozejście mięśnia prostego brzucha. Natomiast do tych mniej znaczących respondentki zaliczyły e, między innymi bóle pachwin. E, spory odsetek respondentek nigdy wcześniej nie spotkał się z pojętem masażu prenatalnego. Z badań wynika, że zdaniem zbadanych przez nas studentek do głównych działań fizjoterapeutycznych, które wprowadzono do terapii w okresie połogu, należą kinesiology taping w leczeniu rozejścia mięśnia prostego brzucha, ćwiczenia wzmacniające mięśnie dna miednicy, korekcje postawy ciała oraz pracy z blizną. Niemal 92,2% respondentek nigdy wcześniej nie korzystała z usług fizjoterapeuty uroginekologicznego, natomiast pozostała grupa badanych, która odpowiedziała twierdząco, określa, że główne, główne przyczyny tych wizyt to bolesne współżycia, uciążliwe bóle menstruacyjne, jak również konsultacje po operacji ginekologicznej. Z badań wynika, iż wiedza studentek kierunków medycznych na temat zastosowania fizjoterapii uroginekologicznej jest na dobrym poziomie. Zdaniem respondentek fizjoterapeuta uroginekologiczny, poradnictwo fizjoterapeuty uroginekologicznego jest pomocne w powrocie do stanu kobiety sprzed ciąży, w tym również do powrotu do aktywności seksualnej, jak również spory odsetek badanych, twierdzi, że fizjoterapeuta uroginekologiczny jest w stanie poprawić jakość życia kobiet po porodzie. Stanowi to ważny aspekt zarówno w sferze zdrowia fizycznego, jak i psychicznego każdej kobiety. Dziękuję za uwagę. Just a short addition from myself. I know that this paper was not strictly Uh, psychiatric, but this is also a sex health uh, session. Yeah. So that's why we classi classified it for this topic. Uh, please, Jury, do you have any questions about the importance of uh, physiotherapy for sex health? Okay, do you have a microphone? Tak, tak, tak. Ja mam takie pytanie, czy wiadomo, jaki procent, chociaż mniej więcej, respondentek w waszym badaniu stanowiły studentki medycyny? Tak, oczywiście. Studentki medycyny były na drugim miejscu razem z kierunkiem położnictwo i było to około 20%. A czy nie, nie, nie robił się takich podziałów ze względu właśnie na profil szkoły respondentek odnośnie tej wiedzy, którą badaliście? Nie robiłeś się takiego podziału. Nie robiłeś się, tylko już się ogólnie. Ogólnie, tak, dokładnie. Mhm. Ja.
Ja też tak dopytam jeszcze odnośnie wiedzy, czy na przykład planujecie rozszerzyć jakoś to badanie, zbadać wiedzę, jak ta wiedza taka medyczna, stricte związana z anatomią, czy podemą płciowej i też zastosowaniem, tak? Bo inną wiedzę będą miały panie studentki z położnictwa, inną wiedzę, tak jak tutaj też pan doktor mówiła, studenci na obecną, może warto to porównać, bo też patrząc na taki produkt praktyczny kontaktu pani położnej później z pacjentką, tak? I jej wiedzy, która może przekazać dalej, tak, pacjentce, bo tak jak mówiłyście i w zakresie aspektów związanych z dysfunkcjami seksualnymi, ale też powrotem do takiej sprawności, bo wiemy, że ta przekona może płciowa może być w różny sposób albo osłabiona, albo napięta i wtedy, i wtedy musimy zastosować odpowiednie treningi, tak, dla pacjentek. Bo takimi elementami możemy badać tą przekonę. Bardziej bym się skupiła na takiej wiedzy, nie? Sprawdzenia. Znaczy jeszcze nie myślałyśmy o kontynuacji tego badania, zastanawiając się. Okej, okay. myślę, że warto rozszerzyć, bo jakby temat jest na topie, tak? Więc on też jest jakby tak, bardzo tak. ważny, bo też prowadzenia różnych technik diagnostycznych, tak? Które możemy wykorzystać w tej pracy. Więc to życzę Wam prowadzenia. Dziękujemy bardzo. Bardzo dziękujemy. Thank you very much. I don't see any more questions from the jury. So we will be moving to the ninth pres presentation. Well, please welcome Alicja Kowalec, Natalia Rodek, with a presentation on the topic of depression, anger, and coping strategies of students in Polish medical faculties. The stage is yours. Okay. Yes. Uh, hello, my name is Natalia Rodek, and I wanted to show you our role, uh, work that I've created with my colleagues named uh, Depression, Anger, and Coping Strategies of Students in Polish Medical Faculties. Uh, as we know, medical studies are one of the toughest and as such, they uh, often demand from students a lot of work, uh, which can lead uh, to burnout, overwork and unhealthy level of stress and subsequently other stress related mental issues. Uh, in our research, we focus on three goals. Firstly, on prevalence, um, depression symptoms and anger issues among medical students. Uh, secondly, uh, what stress coping mechanism they often choose and establishing its protective nature. And finally, uh, we've created two questions about satisfaction and feeling of being overwhelmed. And, uh, and we analyze it uh, in case of uh, depression and anger issues. Our study group included 328 participants, uh, 235 of uh, whom were women and 94 were men. Uh, the average age was uh, 22.46 years, and there was no statistically significant difference in age between females and males. Uh, to determine how, uh, wh which, uh, and uh, if uh, students have uh, depression symptoms and anger issues, we use respectively a back scale and STAXI questionnaire and to uh, determine uh, what uh, stress-related coping mechanism they use, we use COPE questionnaire. And finally, correspondence uh, was made between uh, questions about satisfaction and feeling overwhelmed in context of BDY and STAXI. Uh, one of the most concerning findings uh, was that almost half of students were above cutoff point of moderate depression and uh, answers of almost 10% exceeded cutoff point for severe depression using back scale. These results also were mainly correlated with aggression measured by Staxi questionnaire. And when it comes to strategy most commonly used by students, uh, here you can see all the uh, strategies that we asked for students. Uh, and uh, uh, approach strategies were more, most common rather than avoidant ones and were chosen by over 65%. Uh, 
Unfortunately, multiple regression analysis showed that both types of the scoping strategies did not influence neither STAXI or BDY outcomes, and the mechanism used by students were not effective enough to uh, make a difference, significant difference, protective importance. <laughs> Uh, but uh, BDY outcomes were affected by both of authors' questions. Here you can see uh, the analysis between uh, back scale results and answers to the question, to the statement, medical studies give me great satisfaction. As you can see, more satisfaction uh, is uh, lower back scale results. And also to the question, uh, I feel overwhelmed with the amount of duties. Uh, we see that uh, the students who had uh, felt overwhelmed had worse uh, taxi and back results. So you can, uh, we can say that high level of satisfaction and low level of overwhelmingness have a high protective importance for students. Uh, Unfortunately, we also find out that students closer to finishing their studies were far less likely to agree with the statement, medical studies give me great satisfaction. As you can see, um, people who uh, uh, studies more uh, and were on a six year, uh, they prefer to uh, answer negatively to this question. Uh, so this is very concerning. <laughs> Uh, overall, the number of students uh, presenting depression symptoms and anger issues is very concerning. And uh, in our aim to reduce these uh, symptoms, we should focus on helping them to stay uh, satisfied and not be overwhelmed uh, by the duties they have uh, in their studies. And uh, the other problem is that uh, the tactics, the strategies that they use uh, to uh, help with this uh, are not effective enough. So maybe some professional psychological he help might be the right way to help them uh, finish studies without suffering any negative consequences. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation. Okay, are there any questions from the jury? Okay, so could you tell us about your own input into the presentation? What were your fields of action? Okay, first of all, I made the presentation and uh, uh, my uh, job was to create uh, the uh, online uh, questions <laughs> and to send them to people uh, from all uh, the Pol Poland universities. Uh, so that was... Okay, thank you very much. Any more questions? Uh, I didn't uh, do statistics, <laughs> no. so not my job. Okay, but uh, the group in which you performed yes. the presentation consisted of six people, right? Uh, six or five? Five. Five people. Tours and three. Uh, a lot of people to share the work with. Okay, thank you very much thank for your, your presentation. Yes, yeah. lovely. And now we are moving to the 10th presentation. So uh, please let me upload it on the screen. This is the... Yes. I'm just checking if I'm uploading the right one. Uh, okay, and let me just upload it on the Zoom. Okay. Please welcome uh, Italia Boarajic with the presentation of a work entitled Patterns of Food Selectivity Among Children Diagnosed with Autism Spectrum Disorder. Storage is yours. Thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry for the yeah. thank Okay. You. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Italia Boarajic, and it is an honor to speak to you today about patterns of food selectivity among children diagnosed with autism spectrum disorders. Okay. 
First, let me give you a brief introduction to autism spectrum disorder. Autism spectrum disorder, or ASD for short, is a heterogeneous group of neurodevelopmental deficits, and they include the creation and maintenance of interpersonal relationships, deficits in social communication, and also repetitive and stereotyped behaviors and activities. The aim of our study was to determine the prevalence of traits and the nature of food selectivity in the population of people diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder compared to the neurotypical population. In autism spectrum disorder, uh, the phenomenon of food selectivity is meant to represent the phenomenon of avoiding entire food groups. It affects uh, social functioning and also nutrition. We used our own set of questions that we uploaded to Google Forms, and then we uploaded them to Facebook groups for parents of children with ASD. Also, we interviewed patients of John Paul II's Pediatric Center in Sosnowiec, and children that are enrolled in a school for children with ASD in Biała Podlaska. Our study lasted from May to December 2021. In our questionnaire, we considered various traits of food, such as degree of mixing the ingredients, the taste, crunchiness, temperature, consistency, smell, and color. We interviewed a total of 251 respondents, and in this group, 50.1% were autistic, and the rest was neurotypical. This table shows those descriptive statistics of our results. It uh, shows average values, standard deviation, and p-values for the traits that were statistically significant. I will discuss them in a second. In our case, food selective traits were compared in uh, autistic and neurotypical children. And as food selective traits, we regarded answers does not eat at all or eat reluctantly to our questions regarding food traits. To sum up, children with autism spectrum disorder presented with 24% more of food selective traits, and the mean for autistic children was 9.1, and for neurotypical children, 6.9. When regarding statistically significant traits, we observed that children with ASD were more averse to eating sour foods, but we have not found any statistically significant aversions to other tastes. In uh, regards to texture of the food, children with ASD were more likely than neurotypical children to refuse sticky foods, and also foods with mixed ingredients. And uh, those type of foods where ingredients come in contact on the plate. Children with ASD were also less likely to reach for fruits. To sum up, we regard that those aversions come from both stereotypical patterns of behavior in ASD and also problems with sensory integration, which are an axial symptom of ASD. But in our statistical analysis, we have found out that those stereotypical reasons were the more intense. And in conclusion, those children were selected for both sensory and typical reasons, but those were still typical that differentiate normal people from neurotypical people from people with ASD. Thank you for your attention. I am open to questions, comments, and remarks. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from Marjorie? 
Uh, okay, the mic is in your right Then could you tell a little bit more about methodology? Yes, so we uh, conducted our study with our own set of questions and we divided them into surveys that are going to be completed by pencil paper method and also online. And when it comes to statistic results, we used Statistica program and uh, we conducted human Whitney statistical tests. Mm -hmm. they, they were shown on the table. And what sort of questions do you uh, use? For example, uh, questions does the child uh, willingly or reluctantly or does not eat certain taste? And those are, you know, sour, bitter, sweet. And when it comes to texture, crunchy, sticky. Uh, when it comes to presentation, uh, whether they are mixed or not, whether they are blended. And also when it comes to temperatures, such as cold and hot or the room temperature. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any more questions from the jury or the audience? Okay, so uh, the question that uh, Dr. Piekza asked you was about your overall research methodology, but what was your own personal input into the, the preparation of the research. Uh, we have conceptualized the study together also with Dr. Wilczyński. Uh, we prepared the questionnaires and I wrote an email and distributed the questionnaires to the school for children affected with ISD. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your answer. And please, we will go to the Unlocking the 11th presentation. Did you upload it onto the website? Yes. I'm so sorry. I will have to change. I will have to check it. So, uh, if you have it on a printer, please give it to me. I will try to uh, add it. Plus, sorry for the mis mis malfunction. I haven't noticed it before. And so, please uh, excuse me for such situation. We have some malfunctions with presentations in different uh, in different sessions as well, but I hope that we everything. I'm so sorry for such a situation. Uh, yes, thank you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, it is in the presentation should be. So I will try to demand once more. Oh okay. oh, I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened. I guess we are here. Okay, once again. The twelfth one, which is what was the title of your advanced intention? Yes, the better affect suicide rates. I'm so sorry, as you can see, there is a presentation that's supposed to be put in the system, but I don't have it uploaded. So maybe in the... It should be here, maybe. 
Mówię, że to jakoś to półtora wyglądać będzie. Nie właśnie, jak to było do mapa. Michael? Are you happy? Oh, maybe he. Yes. Yes, you're right. Thank you very much for the help. Which one is this one? Oh, just the one that I'll put this one. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so sorry for the situation that happened, but sometimes we cannot. Okay, um, then I do. Is everything visible? <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you very much. The stage is yours. Please welcome Magdalena Stencil with the paper entitled Does the Water Affect Suicide Rates? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Magdalena Stencil. Wait, wait, and... wait a moment, wait a moment, wait a moment. <laughs> and I invite you to listen to my presentation in which I will try to answer the question, does the weather affect suicide rates? So, I will start with a um, quick introduction and later I will go to the study aim, material and methods, results, and finally I will go to the conclusion. So, mental illnesses are diseases of multifractional and not fully understood etiology. There are a lot of factors which can affect mental health and one of them could be weather conditions. According to this assumption, suicide can be also associated with the weather conditions. There are a few studies that seem to confirm this hypothesis. These studies have shown that wind and higher temperature is connected with higher suicide rates. In Poland, there are also a few studies uh, on this topic, but they are very limited. The aim of our study was to determine the relationship between various weather factors and the number of suicides attempted at suicides uh, obtained and our uh, suicide uh, among uh, the residents of Katowice and Łódź. In our study, we analyzed the data from Institute of Meteorology and Water Management, the public database, and the factors that we analyzed are visible on the slide. We also analyzed the data from the police station in Katowice and Łódź. We gained this data through the access to public information. We performed our statistical analysis by the Excel 365 and Statistica 13,3. We used Shapiro Guild test and Sperman's rank correlation test. So finally, I can go to our results. And first factor I will talk about is temperature. And our general conclusion is that higher temperature favors suicides. In Katowice, higher amount of suicides among female and people aged 50, 54 was connected with higher temperature. Although in which number of male suicides, suicide among people 50, 54, 55, 59, and 80, 84 was connected with higher temperature. The next factor is the occurrence of the lightning. And our general conclusion is that the occurrence of the lighting is connected with higher number of suicides. We observe this in a group of people aged 30, 34, and 75, 79 in Katowice, and 35, 39, and 65, 69 in the Ruch. The next factor is storm. And our general conclusion is the longer storm lasts, the more suicides are attempted. And we observe this in the people aged 50, 54, and 70, 74 in Katowice, and 80, 84 in Łódź. Next factor is duration of the wind. And our general conclusion is that the longer it blows, the more suicides are attempted. 
And we observe this situation in the people aged 50, 54, and 45, 49. And the last factor I will talk about is the turbidity. And our general conclusion is that the longer turbidity lasts, the more suicides are attempted. And we observe this in the people aged 65, 69 in the Katowice. Here are the tables which we created to systematize our result and we mark statistically significant result on P. And here is the table for the Katowice. And here is the table for the Łódź. On this slide, you can see the weather factors which we analyzed, but they show no significant statistical correlation to the number of suicides. So finally, I can go to our conclusion. And our first conclusion is that middle age and elderly people are more sustainable to the weather conditions. Also, we think that the storm and wind can increase the number of suicides. Uh, also, the higher temperature is associated with higher suicidal rates. But we think that the more research is needed to determine exact attempt of the weather to suicide. I thank you for your attention. Here are our references. And we are ready for the discussion. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I understand that Waja is joining us on stage. Yes. Okay. Do you have any questions? The audience, the jury members, there is one from the audience. So while we will pass the mic, I will have my own question. Why exactly did you choose such topic for your presentation? What was your main concern while choosing it? Uh, we think that uh, we need more information when we should focus on our patient, when we should look after them more, and we look for preconditions uh, that can affect suicides and help us to look after our patients and prevent suicides. Okay, thank you. The question for Okay, so my question is, uh, which correlation occurred as the strongest one and in which group? As the strongest uh, one correlation occurred uh, with uh, the turbidity um, in group of, uh, an age of group uh, 65, 69 uh, in Katowice and with the lightning um, uh, also in Katowice, in age of group uh, 75, 79. Mm. And uh, also in which the strongest correlation was mm, with the storm, with a group of age um, 80, 84. Okay. Um, yes, please. Do you have a plan for further research uh, in this in this topic? Uh, what is your plan? Yeah, we plan to extend our uh, research uh, to Dansk because um, uh, we need to city from north of Poland because we have a um, uh, city from south and uh, central Poland. Uh, moreover, yeah. we plan to extend our research to um, uh, Europe, uh, we think about uh, Spain and uh, some Scandinavian country. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. One last question or? Okay, so thank you very much you. for the presentation. You can join us on, on, on the list. Okay, moving on to the 12th presentation. The study of the well-being of people with schizophrenia in the context of their social functioning performed by Alexandra Oretska. Are you with us today? Uh, yes, yes, good morning, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. I try to uh, turn on my camera. Okay, so 
Yes, you can. I'm so sorry. I had the information in my system that you were online. That's why I opened the presentation for you. Okay, so please upload the, the please upload the presentation yourself. Okay. We can't see anything right now. Uh, I don't know what's happened with my camera. I'm really sorry. Um, Michael, in the big brother room, please. I don't know why. It's... Wait a little bit. Uh, do we have a connection with big brother? Wait a minute. Uh, it might be a cause of the administrator turning off your ability to turn off your current on your camera. Right. Okay. Um, I... Do you have a connection with the brother? Michal? I'm so sorry. They are supposed to listen to us all the time, so. Hmm? Wait a little bit. Because you might not be able to upload it. Tak, Michał nie uczestniczka nie może się przełączyć na nie może udostępnić nam swojej prezentacji jest online. Aleksandra Kłodzka. Czy mogę udostępnić ekran po prostu? Bo Okej, okay, okay, dobrze. Okej, okay, widzimy. Uh, everything is all right? Uh, yes, yes, we see it, but we don't see you. Mm. Or maybe, wait, wait a minute, because it might be my, my doing. Uh, but you don't have the um, camera right now. Oh, uh, wait. Um, I, I don't know why it, why it, was, it isn't work, because uh, I think it's it's problem with my camera. Mm -hmm. Yesterday it was okay. Um, it would be a problem if I uh, have turned off my camera. Well, for the presentation purposes, it's harder to judge your performance without seeing you. So we would be grateful if you could manage it. If not, it would be the decision of the jury. Okay, the jury enabled you to to present without the camera. So please carry on. Okay, so. Um, welcome. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, today I would like to tell, tell you something about schizophrenia, uh, our study uh, of the well-being of people with schizophrenia in the context of their social functioning. So schizophrenia belongs to the so-called psychotic disorders, which are states characterized by pathological and inappropriate perception, experience, interpretation, and evaluation of reality. Uh, previous knowledge about psychosis shows us that patients with schizophrenia have difficulties with critical and realistic evaluation of themselves, their environment, and also have impaired relationships with others. The aim of the study was to analyze the daily uh, life of patients with schizophrenia by determining determine the level of their well-being and social functioning. The study involved patients with a diagnosis of schizophrenia from the day ward of the Clinic of Psychiatry and Psychiatric Rehabilitation of the Independent Public Clinical Hospital No. 7 of the Medical University of Silesia in Katowice. Uh, the patients were examined using two questionnaires, the Frankfurt Wellbeing Scale and Bridgewood Social Functioning Scale. Um, when completing the social functioning scale, patients answered questions about uh, frequency of leaving home for any reason, number of friends they have, uh, about employment, uh, frequency of visiting the cinema, theater, or the art galleries, frequency of doing household chores such as washing, cleaning, uh, cooking, and many more uh, questions, something like that. 
And the second scale, the Frank well-being scale, as the same as the name implies, examines the well-being of patients who specify the degree of experiencing the the intensity of worse feelings and emotional states, for example, um, anxiety or lack of concentration, um, and that um, the scale consisted of 36 questions. And we uh, have some results. Um, the skull responses were converted into point values and then the scores were divided into four equal parts um, assigning patients to one of the four uh, four groups in both scale scales separately so uh, as you can see there are four uh, four groups uh, there are um, the red one with medium low and the yellow with medium high and the blue with low and um, the green one with uh, high social uh, functioning in the scale as um, fs and now we can um, take a closer look at the results regarding the respondent's social functioning. So nearly half of patients have medium low social functioning. So it is the red one um, and the yellow. 43,5% uh, of respondents belong to the group with moderately high social functioning. And only for a comma three percent of patients describe their social function functioning as high, and actually the same amount uh, of patients belongs to the group with low social functioning. Um, now I will present the responses regarding the well-being of patients, um, and. As you can see, it is interesting because uh, the same amount of patients uh, belonged to uh, three uh, groups um, as medium, um, medium uh, self-esteem, um, moderately low self-esteem and low self-esteem. And only 8,7% belong to high self-esteem group. And uh, the results of both scales were compared and we made some conclusions. Um, because the main goal of our work was to find the relationship between patients' well-being and their functioning in society. But actually, uh, actually there is no correlation between social functioning and well-being among the patients. But most of them are in the middle group of each category. Um, there is also no correlation between social functioning and having or not having a job. Um, the study shows that patients belonging to both low and high social functioning groups work with the same frequency. Uh, and the third conclusion, there is no correlation between well-being and having or not having a job. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Um, your microphone is turned off. Okay, thank you. Now you hear me? Can you hear yes, me? Yes, 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 now it's okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, now. yes. So, my question is, in your opinion, what is the reason why some people uh, have many complaints, they report many symptoms? But they still can work, they can still be uh, function in the families. And there are other patients who uh, have few complaints who report good uh, still feeling, but they don't work, they uh, <coughs> function. So, what is the reason for that, in your opinion? Uh, okay, uh, I don't know if I uh, exactly hear um, the question properly. Uh, mm, so, in my opinion, uh, the schizophrenia is a very complicated, complicated disease, and um, uh, when we ask um, those patients, every patient was different, and every patient um, 
in other way um, deal with their um, daily problems. Uh, ma many patients um, um, live uh, and have a good relations with their relatives. Some of patients um, not, and um, it's really hard to say uh, what's the um, reason why it is like that. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions? Okay, Jen, please tell us about your own personal input into the presentation, into the, the research you conducted. Okay, my, uh, could you read? Uh, yes, what was your own personal input into the presentation? Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, I read um, a lot about uh, schizophrenia. Uh, I try to understand that um, the disease, and uh, me with my colleagues um, make made interview with patients um, and uh, talk with them, and uh, and that's it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you can stop sharing your screen right now. Thank you. And now moving to one but last presentation. Um, yes. Oh my, are we? Oh, I thought that for a moment I thought that we are dis disconnected from the zone, but I see we are, we are all right. Is the presentation visible or is it visible not fully? I can see it not fully. About it, so is it okay? Please welcome Martin Alisa with the first paper because you have two. Is it right? Only one. Only one. Okay. Uh, impact of film sex on human mental health and physical health. Dzień dobry, ja nazywam się Marta Marywka i mam z przyjemnością przedstawię Państwu moją pracę. Temat prac to organizacja na zdrowie psychicznym i fizycznym człowieka. Co w tym wstępie chciałam powiedzieć, może nie każdy wie, czym jest hemsex, hemsex, czyli inaczej chemiczny seks, jest to stosunek seksualny pod wpływem substancji psychoaktywnych. Na sposób dla przeczyń, czyli substancje są aktywne, mogą mieć wpływ na zdrowie psychiczne i fizyczne człowieka. Dodatkowo substancje są aktywne, mogą również wpływać na zachowanie i podejmowanie decyzji na cywilnej podczas stosunków seksualnych. Celem mojej pracy było zbadanie wpływów na seksualne zdrowie fizyczne i psychiczne człowieka. Materiał i metody w badaniu wzięły udział, wzięły udział 103 osoby praktykujące HEMSEX. Jako narządzę badawczego użyto autorskiego kwestionariusza ankiety składającego się od wniosku w badaniu jednokrotnego i wielokrotnego wyboru. Badania zostały przeprowadzone online za pomocą Google Forms. Wyniki w badaniu wzięły udział, tak jak wspomniałam, 103 że u trzy osoby, bo były to bardzo kobiety, bo to 60%. Przewoj wieku odbywa się między 18 a 39 rokiem życia. 65% rozwiązanych odpowiedziało, że substancje psychoaktywne mają pozytywny wpływ na jakość stosunku seksualnego. Do badania użyto już po prostu kwadrat, który badał interakcję między zwolnieniami. Na podstawie badania wnioskujemy, że respondenci, którzy stosowali substancje psychoaktywne, odprowadzają nie mają pozytywny wpływ na jakość stosunku seksualnego oraz tym samym też przyczyniają się do łatwiejszego podjęcia tej aktywności. Główną prawdą wskazującą podwyższenie jakości stosunku seksualnego były przede wszystkim zwiększone twarności i odwagi podczas stosunku, a także pobudzenie fantazji um, seksualnych. Znaczna część respondentów uważa, że 
jakoś to są postępowane, bo pochodzą się o substancji psychoaktywnej w Brądzeszcze, to bardzo spowodowane dzięki temu, że wzrosły właśnie fantazje seksualne i wzrosła odwaga i śmiałość podczas stosunku. Główną prawem wskazującą na zmniejszoną jakość jest stosunku seksualnego, bo to wybiegły się samotnie, tutaj możemy wskazać nowości, zamiary bólowe i bólu brzucha. Tak jak powiedziałam, były to błędy drogi do się ale także respondenci wskazali na sobie szpek, formalne otępienie, zaburzone erekcje i brak kontroli nad podejmowaniem ciała, podejmowanie ryzykowanej decyzji, zaburzone osobowości, depresja i zaburzone nastroje. Prawie 71% respondentów wskazało, że odczuwają skutki uboczne po zażyciu substancji psychoaktywnych. Główne skutki uboczne to przede wszystkim wzrostem na poczucie oraz zysku stawienia. Ponad 56% osób, które zażywają substancje, chcą tyle, że miały negatywny wpływ na instrukcję chemiczną. Ponad 60% ankietowanych stwierdziło, że substancje psychoaktywne mają negatywny wpływ na zdrowie fizyczne. I wskazałem tutaj głównie, że było to zanadliwe się somatyczne. Na podstawie zestawienia pytań, wyrachowo respondenci, którzy uważają substancje psychoaktywne, wpływają na zdrowie psychiczne, wpływa też na zdrowie fizyczne. Na podstawie kolejnych dwóch pytań, które zestawiłam, Ankietowani stwierdzili, że stwarzowanie substancji psychoaktywnej była na pewno zdrowie zdrowie zarówno psychiczne, jak i fizyczne. Na podsumowanie chciałbym powiedzieć, że chemistyk sprawa na zdrowie fizyczne i psychiczne człowieka. Badania pokazały, że nie mają ani chemii pozytywnej do badań. Ankietowani odczuwali negatywne klasy również na zdrowie fizyczne i psychiczne. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I will carry on in English because I'm in, in this uh, situation. Are there any questions? Of course, you can ask them uh, in Polish. Ja mam takie pytanie, jak zdefiniowaliście się pojęcie substancji psychomotywnej? To jest pewnie zupełnie szeroka grupa, bez jakiejś określonej definicji, w szczególności w kontekście rozpowszechnienia substancji, które są najbardziej popularne, jako w Polsce, czyli syntetycznych kanałach, czy katynowych, urażanych do okazji spokojnymi. Myślę, że to jest niezwykle istotne. Miałam właśnie w badaniu takie pytanie, na to substancje dożywali, i tam amfetowani również wskazywali, że były to amfetaminy, mesodrium, GHP i głównie te substancje. A które były najczęściej spożywane? Amfetaminy. Okej, okay. dziękuję. Też chciałam to spytać. Natomiast y, mam jeszcze jedno pytanie. W jaki sposób pozyskaliście tą grupę badaną? Są 103 osoby. To znaczy, czy... Y, y, bo to było badanie internetowe, tak? Tak, mówię, ja. Ach, tak. To znaczy, czy to dosz, mieliście dostęp do jakiejś grupy, która się utożsamia z chemseksem i, i konkretnie tam, że się te na jakąś tam platformę wysyłali te no, scenariusze, czy, czy, czy to? Ja tam tak ja. tylko szukałam grup, które są na tym skupione skupi na, na imprezach, bo tak naprawdę najczęściej podczas szlaków podczas te substancje stosowane i chęci są spraktykowane i najwięcej odpowiedzi miałam właśnie z tamtych grup. Udostępniłam również tę ankietę na grupach ze środowiska medycznego i z tamtych miałam znacznie mniej odpowiedzi. Dobrze, dziękuję za pierwsze ja. Jak badamy zdrowie, na zdrowie seksualne, to musimy mieć standaryzowane narzędzia, które warto wykorzystać w tej pracy. Ja myślę, że pamiętać w przyszłości, bo mnie zastanawia wasz chwór, bo to jest twoje badanie, 
autorskiej kwestii nie, bo mamy na tak. zdrowiu psychicznym, mówimy o zdrowiu seksualnym, czyli należy pamiętać o tym, że są narzędzia, którym możemy te dwa aspekty zbadać, więc przyszłościowo warto by rozszerzyć o to. Okay. I też mieć jakby na uwadze, że masz dużą grupę, którą przebadałaś, może warto byłoby bardziej bardziej przeanalizować właśnie też te substancje, z jakiego czasu, tak, do tego brakuje takich, takich statystycznych informacji, też danych, które by nam pokazały faktycznie, jak długo jest spożywana dana substancja i też mówimy o negatywnym wpływie na, na zdrowie, tak, tak? czyli tak. też jakby bardziej analitycznie do tego podejść. Jasne. Praca bardzo ciekawa. Dziękuję. Dziękuję. Właśnie skończył się czas. Dziękuję bardzo. much. Uh... Ja to przerobiłem odniesienie na tablicę. Właśnie, bo pytałam, tak. czy masz. Ja? Ok, so not leaving the stage, but with, no, with different presentation. Once again, we are sharing the screen. Taking an orgasm on the moment. Moim kolejnym tematem pracy, na którą się poświęciłam, jest udawanie orgazmu wśród kobiet. Myślę, że również ciekawy. Rzuty seksualne kobieta jest pozwolone bardzo ważną częścią jej życia. Nie sposób powiedzieć, że tak przyznać, że uczestnik orgazmu wśród kobiet, wśród kobiet może mieć wpływ na jakość i satysfakcję z życia seksualnego. Każda kobieta tak naprawdę jest inna i w inny sposób może dopłukać swoje seksualne potrzeby. Starym badaniem było sprawdzenie przyczyn udawania organizmu wśród kobiet, a także określenie rangi problemu. Badanie wzięło udział w samej kobiety. Była to przedna grupa, było 406 kobiet. I jako narzędzie badawczego użyto analityczne dotyczące na przyszłanki, to składającego się z 33 pytań jednokrotnego i wielokrotnego wyboru. I tutaj tak samo pani minister przeprowadzono o niej za pomocą Google Forms. Wyniki znaczna część, znaczna większa część osłonów odpowiedziała, że odczuwa satysfakcję z życia seksualnego. To badanie może to również testu Hikwadra. Na podstawie wyników badań rozprawiające stwierdzenie, że odczuwają satysfakcję z życia seksualnego i często udają orgazm podczas stosunku, natomiast osoby, które stwierdziły, że łączą satysfakcję z życia seksualnego, głównie częściej udają orgazm. Badanie wymagają także osoby, które zawsze potrafią osiągnąć orgazm. Rozpadnięcie, które Zawsze potrafią osiągnąć organizm podczas masturbacji. Najczęściej i czasami osiągają organizm podczas stosunku pracowego, a 21% więcej osiąga podczas stosunku pracowego. Badania również pokazują, że respondenci, którzy potrafią osiągnąć organizm podczas masturbacji, najczęściej nie osiągają organizm podczas stosunku analnego. Dodatkowe badania ukazały, że ankietowanie, które potrafią osiągnąć organizm podczas masturbacji, najczęściej czasami nie zawsze, w 49% osiągają organizm podczas stosunku oralnego. Wyniki pokazały także, że tylko 35% kobiet nigdy nie udaje orgazmu, prawie 44% ankietowanych kobiet czasami udaje orgazm, prawie 18% kobiet często udaje orgazm i prawie 3,5% pewnych kobiet zawsze udaje orgazm. Ponad 87% respondentek stwierdziło, że mimo istniejącego problemu nie zgłosiły się do specjalisty w celu rozwiązania problemu. Badanie pokazało również, że prawie 83% badanych kobiet określonego stosunek seksualny może mieć wpływ na osiągnięcie orgazmu. 
70% ankietowanych kobiet stwierdziło, że orgazm nie jest jedynym znacznikiem udanego współżycia. Prawie 92% respondentów stwierdziło, że gra w ma wpływ na późniejsze odczucia seksualne. Właśnie tutaj wyjątkowanie od kobiet odpowiedziało, że występuje u nich problem podczas współżycia. Głównym problemem było przede wszystkim miasto libido, lęki emocjonalne, bo to lęczy mi ścianę ciążą, łaska pełna strach przed przerwaniem przez osoby trzecie. Wskazały to kobiety także również problem, jakim jest sobie się pochwy. Na pytanie, dlaczego, jaki jest powód, dla którego kobiety udają orgazm, to chciało, że głównym problemem jest chęć zapewnienia partnera. Odpowiadało również, że była to chęć emocjonalnej ludzi z partnerem, a także strach przed rapsem partnera. Głównym problemem, dla którego kobiety nauczyły satysfakcję z tego życia seksualnego, był problem z, z osiągnięciem orgazmu, męskiej libido i oraz nadmierny stres. Na podsumowaniu chciałabym powiedzieć, że badanie ukazało, że kobiety, które naprawdę uważają bardziej kobiety, są bardzo i wpływ na to kilka czynników. Myślę, że najważniejszym tutaj jest cynika. Dodatkowo wstępują również czynniki głośne, też to są też kwestie. Dodatkowo też kobiety stwierdziły, że stosunek seksualny ma wpływ na osiągnięcie odwozu. Respondentki również odpowiedziały, że nie udawały się do specjalistów w związku z zastępującym problemem, a główna powodem, dla którego udają orgazm, jest chęć zadowolenia partnerem. Dziękuję za Dobrze. Pani doktor, mikrofon czy coś byśmy mogli? Proszę mi powiedzieć, czy y, ma Pani jakieś obserwacje, bo czy nadała Pani y, to, o czym Pani mówi, w zależności od wieku tych kobiet, i w jakim przedziale wiekowym te kobiety się mieściły? I czy były jakieś różnice odnośnie młodych kobiet, starszych kobiet, odnośnie wykształcenia, czy zawodu, czy wykonywanej pracy, czy schorzeń innych? Były takie czynniki brane pod uwagę? Brałem pod uwagę kobiety w różnym wieku. Ważne i grupa stanowiła kobiety między 19 a 59 rokiem życia, natomiast znaczna większość kobiet w Australii Wielkiej umieściła się w granicy 20-30 lat. Natomiast nie ma tego podstawowej pracy. Wykształcenie? Wykształcenie wiadomo pod uwagę i jeżeli chodzi o wykształcenie, to odpowiadają głównie osoby, które ukończyły studia licencjackie i magisterskie. Znaczna mniejszość to osoby, które kończyły studia doktoranckie, tak samo jak szkoły zawodowe. A czy były jakieś różnice między no, tymi parametrami odnośnie że udawaniem orgazmu, a powiedzmy, no, tak, o tych różnic, o których Pani mówi. Wydaje mi się, że to jest bardzo istotne też dla Jolu, to pomyśli. Dobrze, ja jeszcze wiesz. Ja to byłoby dodać coś, bo nam faktycznie zmodyfikowano tu jakoś życie. Udawano orgazm w dzisiejszych czasach też nie musi nazwać stan, że kobiety nie mówią, że w ogóle do doświadczenia prawda? I też jak mam weryfikację tego pod względem wiedzą właśnie narządów intetnych, budowy, struktur, skąd w ogóle ten orgazm może jakby dochodzić na ten impuls, jak, jak jest analizowany, więc jakby tu warto było to rozszerzyć. Okay. No i te standaryzowane narzędzia, na które w seksuologii mamy, ja muszą być do tego, żebyśmy faktycznie obiektywną ocenę postawiły, to jest subiektywna, tak, na zasadzie standaryzacji swojego narzędzia, a tutaj bardzo ważne jest to, kiedy my mówimy o aspekcie medycznym, metodologicznym, brakuje tych narzędzi, więc przyszłościowo warto jakby to rozszerzyć i wtedy jeszcze już miała dobrą pracę to, że tego, żeby później opublikować, bo to są ciekawe badania. Tylko w ogóle metodologicznie trzeba wypracować, jak dodać, myślę, że się spotkamy na spotkaniu kolejnym, to Czy jeszcze tylko co, bo jeżeli taką wodę nie mówimy, to jednak powiedziała analiza statystyczną, bo ja rozumiem, że wszystko było no, tylko testem badania różnic między grupą, tak? No, na takie pewnie wstępną orientację badanie 
Mhm. Jest to ok, natomiast też przydałoby się, żeby jakiś już kierunek też tych różnic, tak? Czy w przypadku tam były też problemy, które można by już na troszeczkę do paniejszej skali przedstawić i jakiś by paniejszy na tych stawek też tak no to, to też na pewno byłoby w połączeniu jeszcze z tymi skalami wystandaryzowania nie jednym ciekawszy. Yes, and that was the end of the time for discussion. Thank you very much for the presentation. All of the 14 presentations were presented. Thank you very much to the presenters, both on site and online. Thank you for the jury members for being here judging the, the works. And please, Professor Krista, if you could sum up the, the session. Wszystkich wystąpień. Wszyscy Państwo bardzo dużo w pracy włożyli, bardzo dużo się Państwo zaangażowali, żeby to żeby przygotować, pracować wyniki badań, przeprowadzić to te badania i przyznać prezentację. Bardzo się Państwo starali, tak bardzo Państwu serdecznie gratuluję tego. Nie leży tego, kto ma nie miejsce, wiadomo, że będą oceny pracy, znaczy oceny pracy dokonaliśmy dobrze to policzone i tam. Będą za to przyznawane miejsca poszczególne, ale myślę, że to nie jest najważniejsze. Ważne jest to, że Państwo zdobywacie doświadczenia właśnie w prowadzeniu badań. Jak już to już, już mamy kliniczne robić, także Także już co tych pracy widzę jest coraz więcej, właśnie klinicznych. Państwo już, tak powiem, wrócili się do szpitali, wrócili się do różnych ośrodków, instytucji, które się zajmują pacjentami i są już rzeczywiście badania takie um, oparte na, na, na Państwa w kontakcie z pacjentem, co mnie bardzo cieszy. Yy, mieliśmy się bardzo szeroki zakres tematyczny, psychiatria, seksuologia, psychiatria dorosłych, dziecięca. Także mieliśmy bardzo dużą różnorodność prac. To jest też bardzo ważne. Cieszymy się, że mieliśmy koleżankę z Łotwy. Madara mi like to thank you that we joined us for this session today. And we hope that you can, you can join us perhaps next year or some other conferences for students. Taką ciekawostką było to, że pojawiła się pierwsza praca na temat sztucznej inteligencji. Myślę, że przypuszczam, że za rok takie prac będzie o wiele więcej. Ja to taki swój ten komentarz osobiście do tego, do tego się tematu dorzucę, bo są różne podejścia właśnie do sztucznej inteligencji. Dużo jest takiej dyskusji, że w ogóle to należy zabronić. Nawet Słyszałem, że Uniwersytety w Wielkiej Brytanii, a nawet Oxford czy Cambridge zabroniły studentów używania czatu GPT, co mnie bardzo szokuje, ponieważ Cambridge to jest, jak Państwo wiecie, tam jednym z, z takich wybitnych badaczy, który tam pracował, był Alan Turing, właściwie taki ojciec sztucznej inteligencji. I jeżeli taka instytucja, taka uczelnia zabrania studentów używania sztucznej inteligencji, to znamy to dziwne. Także ja tutaj zachęcam Państwa wręcz przeciwnie tego, żeby ten temat jak najbardziej eksplorować dalej, bo jest to Państwa przyszłość. Myślę, że za kilka lat, jak Państwo słyszycie, trudnie to używanie sztucznej inteligencji w, w diagnozowaniu chorób będzie właśnie standardem, więc, więc jak najbardziej uczcie się Państwo używać tego narzędzia. Wiadomo, że czasami jeszcze mamy różne Niedoskonałości związane z tym, ja sam na przykład yy, zapytałem czat, żeby mi zaproponował metodologię, tam sobie wymyśliłem temat badania, żeby mi zaproponował metodologię, więc wymyślił test yy, psychologiczny, który nie istnieje. A że takie rzeczy jeszcze się zdarzają, musimy być krytyczni, ale niezależnie od tego zachęcam tak, żeby się właśnie uczyć, żeby robić próby, czasami możemy jakieś tam śmieszne odpowiedzi uzyskać ale się tym nie zajmę, bo myślę, że ta metoda będzie udoskonalana i tak mówię, za taki lat to będzie w Państwa czucie pracy już standard, więc puszczcie się Państwo i, 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 i próbujcie i ćwiczcie. Także jeszcze Państwu wszystkim bardzo dziękuję. 
Jeszcze gratuluję i do zobaczenia za rok. Summary of the session. Uh, as I can say, this was the ending of the psychiatry and sexology health, sex health uh, session during SIM 2023. Thank you all for your participation in the session. Uh, I have a few things to say about the workshop. So I will be saying it in Polish for this is the um, stationary event. But before I do so, I would like to ask you all to join me on the stage for a group photo. Uh, Madara and Alexandra, could you show yourself on cameras? If you're still with us. It's okay, yes, I'm still, yes, I'm still, but uh, I don't know how to fix it, actually. Oh, yeah.